Hi, everyone. My name is Tanya Hertz, and I'm the director of the Regional Entrepreneurship Center, the Rec Innovation Lab at San Diego Miramar College. And I'd like to thank our partners at this time and give a special thanks to SDSU's Lavin Center, the SDSU Zip Launchpad. We'd like to thank the California Entrepreneurship Educators Conference. Also like to thank Harness, the Brink SBDC at USD, San Diego Unified Schools. We'd also like to thank School of Entrepreneurship and Technology, High Tech High, the Regional Advisory Committee, Alex Waters at the Jacobs Center, Connect All, 21 IQ Labs, Startup Quest, Productified. Like to thank Course Key and Tech Coast Angels. Thank you to Village Up, City Heights Development Corporation, San Diego Angel Conference, Startup San Diego, SBDC, Score San Diego, We Are Kingdom, New Media Rights, San Diego Tech Hub, Origin 63, Ambrosio 15, OmniSync, Optima Office, Proven Recruiting, Craft Leadership, GSNL Consulting. Thank you to all of our partners. We couldn't do what we do without you. Thank you. Now we are recording. So uh, just so everybody knows we are doing the recording. And uh, if you if you wouldn't mind during the workshop, we will, uh, I'll ask everybody to turn off their microphones and turn off their cameras for the workshop. And then if you have questions, make sure that you either type them in the chat. Angela and Enzo uh, will be keeping an eye on that chat and they'll let me know if I need to answer anything. Or you can always just unmute yourself and ask something that way. So uh, well, we are getting the rest of the a couple more people coming over. I will uh, just share one more little quick video about the rec so that everybody knows um, who I am and what we're doing. <clears throat> and uh, so my name is Tanya Hertz. I am the director of the Rec Innovation Lab here at Miramar College. And we're a business incubator, a local business incubator on the campus of Miramar. We're dedicated to diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're dedicated to helping people to realize their dreams, to, to, to start companies based around their passions. And we really, uh, we really focus on helping people to start those high growth startups, startups that have the potential to scale and to be, and to be big. And so if you have that kind of an idea, we encourage you to to, to join us, to reach out to the REC. We have an open information session coming up on April 22nd, and you can learn more about how to actually start a company. Uh, we, we particularly love helping uh, people who are uh, from the DEI population, people who maybe before didn't have access to those resources. So uh, uh, like me, myself, I'm first generation American, first generation entrepreneur, first generation college student, or now college professor. And I'm a, I teach entrepreneurship at Miramar and about a decade teaching at SDSU. And let me just show a little bit longer this video. And we won't watch the whole thing, but just watch a little bit of it while we're getting the rest of the people in. My name is Tanya Hertz, and I am the founder and director of the Rec Innovation Lab at San Diego Miramar College. I get to watch life and fast forward in entrepreneurship. I get to watch people who come up with ideas and very quickly get these ideas uh, into the hands of, of the customers and the users, and they're growing their companies very, very fast. They're winning competition. Hi, Tanya. It's not, it looks like we lost the sound. Disciplines to work together alongside entrepreneurs, child development specialists, and mechanics, yeah. all with the goal of innovating the work that they do. One of the biggest takeaways, not just for me, but for everybody here at REC, is the connections part. So we are making a lot of connections here with industry experts, professionals, and entrepreneurs. It offers an environment where you can actually... All right, so I'm going to... Uh stop that stop that video there Open up. stop that video there and uh, I, I have in the chat uh, shared with you the a link to this powerpoint presentation so i encourage all of you to if you'd like to you can access that powerpoint presentation and you can watch any of the videos you want and you can uh, read more you'll see this is jam-packed. We have a lot of things we're going to be covering today. And the focus of today's workshop is really helping people who are uh, 
who are immigrants start companies. And um, but that doesn't mean that you have to be an immigrant in order to in order to to be here or to take value from this workshop. We're hoping that uh, that all of you will find something of value in here. But there's a lot in here. So this is just some of the things that we are covering in the PowerPoint and in the presentation. And I just couldn't pass up the opportunity to share as much as I could with all of you, because I know that we do have a lot of, uh, of immigrant entrepreneurs in the audience today, and uh, they, you have questions and you want to know so, so many different things. And so I included all of that in the PowerPoint. And we'll cover most of it, not all of it, but um, you can access it there and then we can always follow up, right? And you can ask me uh, questions. Uh, we'll leave time today also for Q&A at the end. So entrepreneur versus employee, right? What's the difference? Let's start there. We're going to start at the base. Entrepreneur versus employee. Uh, just at a very basic level, does anybody want to give me uh, what you think of as the difference between an entrepreneur and an employee in just one sentence? Anyone want to throw it out there? You can put it in the chat too. <clears throat> risk. Risk. Okay. So that was Jasmine. Oh, hi, Jasmine. We showed your video a little bit um, ago. So uh, risk. What else? Any other things that you think of the difference between entrepreneur versus employee? Um, an entrepreneur um, is their own boss and an employee is under somebody. Okay, nice. So an, an entrepreneur is his or her own boss where an employee is uh has a boss right is the boss versus has the boss what else any other things that we can think of as different also think an employee is already like using money that is with a business that's like settled and everything whereas an entrepreneur is either using their own money or trying to get money from investors and that kind of stuff to build their business Mm -hmm, absolutely. And there's always that component of our own money when we're talking about entrepreneurship, that uh, especially if you're starting uh, your first, second or third company, people want to see that you have some skin in the game, that you have some vested, uh, invested into the, into the business itself. So you are all absolutely right when you're thinking about the difference between entrepreneurs and employees. The, the main difference that we use, uh, the criteria that we use in entrepreneurship education is ownership right? Ownership of the business in which they work, right? If you don't have ownership, you don't, you aren't an entrepreneur, you're, you're, you're an employee, right? Um, now entrepreneurs have many other, many other uh, characteristics that make them entrepreneurs. They do have that freedom to choose what they want to do, when they want to do it. Nobody's telling them how to, when, where, or what, and um, they do engage in risk. In fact, that word entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, anybody here speak French? So uh, French, those, I don't know if we have any French speakers, no. Okay, well, if you, we did have a French speaker in the audience, they would let us know that entrepreneurship is from a French word and it literally means somebody who takes risk. So we're gonna go over the different kinds of entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship, especially with that immigrant focus. But I want you to take a look at, at these, uh, you don't have to read all of them, but these are a, a list of different kinds of people some of them might be entrepreneurs. Does anybody, um, does anybody in this list see uh, which could be classified as entrepreneurs, which could not be classified as entrepreneurs? Um, and I'll just kind of point out some of them. The first one, a stay-at-home mom who runs a daycare out of her apartment. Would that person be considered an entrepreneur? Would a commercial pilot who gives flight lessons? Would um, a mobile car detailer? Um, the owner of a laundromat, a Mexican citizen from Tijuana who provides uh, wedding planning services. Are any of these people considered entrepreneurs? Well, they all are, right? They all are entrepreneurs. All of these this, in this list are entrepreneurs. And actually these are descriptions. I just picked a dis uh, several descriptions of some of my entrepreneurship students. So every single one of these are, are my students and every single one of these are entrepreneurs because they meet that criteria. It doesn't have to be a huge startup. Oh, and by the way here, uh, just, one of these here, the founder and CEO of a $40 million ed tech startup. That is uh, that is one of my former students. And some of you might know him. He's also the uh, one of the mentors at the rec. Uh, it's, uh, it's Ryan Vancher from Korski. And his business is uh, raising their Series B right now and just got valued at $40 million. They started that business five years ago and they're uh, first generation uh, 
college community college students who went on to university and started this company. So there's all kinds of entrepreneurs, all kinds of entrepreneurs. Why people choose this path? Well, many number of uh, uh, many different reasons why people might choose this path. But the one thing that I like to to say with entrepreneurship is you can be you can be comfortable, you can be well off with uh, as an employee. And, and the path to being comfortable to the middle class is definitely education. We need to have an education in order to be okay. But if you want to be wealthy, if you really, really, really want to be wealthy, there's no path other than entrepreneurship, right? You need to have that ownership if you want to be wealthy in, in this country. And, uh, and we see wealth created many times over in, in entrepreneurship. I love my job because I love seeing people get rich. It's, it's, and it's not, um, it's not a pipe dream. It's not, it's not, um, you know, it's not a crapshoot. There's some things that we can do to improve our probability of being successful as an entrepreneur. And, uh, you're doing one of those things right this very moment. And that's getting that entrepreneurship education. So another reason why people get or become entrepreneurs, we see a lot of people who may, you know, maybe would rather be an employee, but they might not have a social security number. Now, if you, if you have a, uh, if you don't have a social security number, can you work in this country? Well, it's difficult, right? It's difficult. Um, can you work as an entrepreneur though? Um, not as an employee? Well, that's actually, you know, it's actually easier. It's actually easier. So the IRS issued a special type of identification for immigrants, for people, even if they have, um, if they're undocumented immigrants, even they, the IRS doesn't care about your documentation status. They don't care about, um, they don't care about whether or not your visa is current because they want your money. And so they have a way for you to pay taxes. And, and um, we're going to talk about the, the path that you can use to do that um, here in a little bit. Um, but it's it's essentially your ITIN, and, and we'll talk about how to get that in a little bit. Um, but many of the people who are entrepreneurs and who pay taxes on entrepreneurs, or as entrepreneurs rather, are are independent contractors, they're freelancers, they're gig workers. And again, we'll talk about what that means. But I just wanted to point out that immigrants are entrepreneurial more so than the, than the general population. There's so many research studies out there that just show if you're an immigrant, or first generation US um, citizen, you are more likely to start a company. And you are, uh, you, you are, if you're an immigrant, you're just an immigrant, you're twice as likely to start a company than Native Americans, and, and in all different kinds of industries. So it's not just those those gig worker, the freelance or the small businesses, it's the tech firms, it's engineering, it's those high growth startups um, that immigrants start. 45% of major um, engineering and technology firms, uh, those that were started out of Silicon Valley, had at least one immigrant founder, so almost half of them. And um, we know it's not just documented or undocumented, it's all kinds of immigrants. So about 10% of undocumented immigrants are actually entrepreneurs, so they're owning their own businesses, they're making money that way. And so if... Um, you know, if anybody says that uh, that undocumented immigrants don't pay taxes, yeah, right. Uh, they 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 generated seventeen point two billion dollars in business income last year. They pay taxes. They hire people that also um, then um, pay the taxes, depending on if they're paid as an independent contractor or an employee. There are there's so much wealth being created by these uh, immigrant entrepreneurs and Opla. Yes. Tani. Yeah, I just noticed that. I, I noticed that I was trying to move our, our pictures around and I ended up muting myself. So uh, you guys can hear me now. I'm assuming you'll tell me if not. <laughs> but uh, so back to what we were talking about. So what kind of uh, businesses are they starting? Well, all kinds, all kinds. So th there are legal forms of business ownership, and then there are sort of colloquial or um, just, uh, you know, terms that we use just in everyday language uh, for business owners. But these are the legal forms of ownership, right? Sole proprietorship, partnership, an LLC, limited partnership. 
uh, corporation, nonprofit. Uh, there's also co-ops. There's, there's a few other uh, legal entities or legal forms of ownership, but, uh, but I wanted to kind of, uh, kind of, and you can read through them. Here's uh, descriptions of the forms of ownership. And again, you have access to these slides, but I kind of wanted to talk about like the freelancers or the independent contractors and what kind of owners are they? Because there's always, a, you know, there's a lot of questions I get about this and a lot of misunderstanding or, um, well, misunderstanding and also misinformation and disinformation about this. So freelancers, gig workers, independent contractors, you know, which are you and, um, or what would you be classified as and what do they, what does that actually uh, mean? So, let me see here. Um, so, blah, let me go back, Oops, sorry. So uh, again, a, a freelancer or an independent contractor would be somebody who's working for themselves and providing a service on, on, a, on a gig type of a, of a job. So that means it's short term in nature. It's not, uh, you're not paid with a, a the the typical uh, the typical uh, W-2 route, you receive your pay on your 1099. And uh, like often people will ask me, so is does that mean that freelancer is a legal form of business ownership or is gig worker a classification? Does anybody know, do we have those as classifications as legal ownership? Want to take a guess? You think that's yes, no? I'm not sure, but I guess no. I think you're guessing right. Guess is no. So what would you be classified as? So let's say you just, you, you decide that you want to be an entrepreneur and you're going to sell some, I don't know, let's say you make some jewelry and you're going to sell it on Etsy. What would you be classified as uh, for the IRS? You have to be something, right? So what are you? Are you, anybody know? Um, just guessing an independent contractor. So independent contractor is not a technical legal definition of a, a business owner. So it's something else, but that's a good guess. I mean, you are, but that's, yeah. What would we, independent contractor, what, what do we classify them as, right? Probably be like its own company, like sole proprietorship. Aha, there it goes. You got it. It's, you are your own company and it is bah, 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 sole proprietorship, sole proprietorship, right? Now, that means that uh, if you do nothing, if you do nothing, you are by definition a sole proprietor. So you, um, that means that all of your assets are intrinsically linked to the company itself. And so are all of the liabilities. So if you get sued as a business, you're getting sued as a person, right? You, there's nothing in that sort of ownership that, that protects you through the business structure. And so be thoughtful about what type of ownership you're choosing because you may not want to be a sole proprietorship and all that it entails, all you need to do is file a little bit of paperwork and then you're protected. So that's uh, something to keep in mind, something to keep in mind. And a lot of times people just don't get it. And that's why they end up being sole proprietors. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, make sure also besides choosing that, that type of ownership, choose the right kind of company. Don't ever... I shouldn't tell you what to do. You do what you want to do in life, but I would never recommend that somebody starts a company without some passion, without some uh, love of what you're doing. And it's, it's almost, I mean, it's, it's tied to, to, to entrepreneurship. And why am I so, why am I so adamant about that? Does anybody think, like, why do you think I'm so, like, you have to be passionate about what you do in order to be an entrepreneur in that field? Anyone? Well, as an entrepreneur, you're usually met with some pushback about certain things and you have to be passionate and able to get through those things because you don't have passion. What else is motivating you? Yes, Mary Lyles, you are so right. Uh, if, if, if you're an entrepreneur, I guarantee you, you've heard no more than, more, more than the average bear, right? You hear no a lot. You get a lot of pushback. So you have to be able to to roll with the nose, roll with the punches and keep going to the yes. Any other reasons? Anyone else have anything to add there? What about the, the amount of time that you work? There was a popular book a few years ago called the, the four hour work week. 
Sorry, um, I had to put it here. Passion will determine how much you persevere. It will also determine how much time you dedicate, you know, to it. Because when you work for someone, nine to five is nine to five. But <laughs> when you're an entrepreneur, you're like, because of your goals and what you're trying to achieve, you're just going to keep going. <laughs> you are so right, Shola. You are so right. I tell you, you will not work 40 hours a week if you're an entrepreneur. You'll work 80 hours a week. You'll work 100 hours a week. And you have to have that passion in order to give you the fuel to keep going or, you know, you're, you're just going to fizzle out. So even if the, the goal is making money and it should be, we should have that underlying financial uh, motivation. We still have to have that passion. Thank you. Yeah, good, good. So what if you don't have a social security number? What if you don't have a social security number? What do you do? Well, there are a lot of different things you can do. Uh, there are several different things that you can do to legitimately earn money, file taxes, and um and make a living here in the United States. And we're going to talk about that ITIN and EIN in just a little bit, but you guys are, are doing the right thing by taking uh, this class, by taking, uh, getting an education in entrepreneurship. All of these things help. All of these things help uh, increase your probability of success and decrease your chances of failure. Okay. So ITIN, let's talk about this now, because this comes up a lot. What's this ITIN? ITIN, Individual Taxpayer Identification Number. It's a tax number. It's um, it's the the social security number for you if you don't have a social security number or can't get a social security number, and it takes the place of that. And it's just created spe specifically for immigrant entrepreneurs. You can get one; it doesn't cost anything. You can get one easy peasy. Uh, it takes no time at all. You can get one online in about five minutes. And uh, the reason why they make it so easy and encourage everyone to do this is because they want um, they want your money, your tax money, right? So ITINs are intended for fed federal tax reporting. Having an ITIN does not authorize work in the U.S. However, work authorization is not required to earn a living as an independent contractor or business owner in the U.S., if that makes sense. Okay, so you know, this is like, a, this all often reminds me of the whole medical marijuana uh, conundrum where it's illegal illegal federally but legal uh, statewide uh, this is similar in that there's it's kind of a gray area here for immigrant particularly undocumented immigrant entrepreneurs or people who don't have a visa or are not here um, yeah are, are not here with their with their paperwork so you still can pay taxes. You still can have a business. Just kind of fuzzy area. So IRS uh, code sixty one thirty makes it illegal for the IRS to disclose information obtained from your taxes or from your ITIN application to other fed federal agencies, including the police and immigration. Okay, why do why do I say that? Why does that matter? What do you think? I guess because this is a fair issue, you know, that stops a lot of people from um, finding out how they could earn money um, with this status, you know. So this is something that, if more people knew about this, I think it would be a lot easier. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, yeah. starting a business. <laughs> yes, yes, Shola. Yes, if more people knew about this, I, I agree. I think more people would start companies here in the United States and make more money, right? And and even get very wealthy. But they're afraid. They're afraid that if they come and they apply for an ITAN, boom, immigration is going to be called and they're going to haul them away. Legally, they're not allowed to do that. I, I, I'm never going to say 100% certainty because, I mean, we see what's been happening with the world lately, and I don't trust the police or, or government agencies either. But we know that, that in the past, I have seen the IRS be very, very good about maintaining confidentiality, about not reporting people to immigration. Because why? They want your money. They want your money. And, you know, there's obviously still a risk, but I've, I've never seen personally in, in over a decade of, of doing this, the IRS uh, breach somebody's confidentiality or tune somebody in uh, to immigration, right? And, and I think it makes sense why. So uh, what do you do with this ITAN? Well, this ITAN is like your social security number. It takes the place of it. Uh, it allows you to pay taxes, report your earnings, open an interest-bearing bank account with um, uh, without 
oftentimes without even any money. You you can open these uh, these bank accounts with uh, as little as like ten dollars, and uh, you often though first have to apply for and obtain an EIN, and the EIN is uh, only obtained with either your social security number or your ITIN. The EIN, that's your employer identification number, just like your SSN is your social security number. Well, the EIN is your social security for your business, basically. Um, it's how we identify your business. It's how you hire people. It's how you raise funds. It's how you uh, do any number of things that a business does as its own uh, sort of person or individual, but as a business, right? Um, you can't use your social security number and your ITIN at the same time, but can you use your ITIN and your EIN at the same time? Yes. Or your SSN and EIN? Yes. It's just those SSN and ITIN can't be used simultaneously. Okay. How do you apply? Uh, here's the process of applying by mail. So if you want to do it even old school snail mail way, there's, uh, I laid out the process. Most people don't, we just go online and we file for it. And um, there is much, I, I've included so much information on this process for you. <clears throat> and uh, I would recommend all of you, all of you, if you're considering starting a business, opala, get an EIN. Now, is an EIN required by law? Well, it depends on what you're doing. If you're filing for an incorporation, opala, if you're filing for a partnership, an LLC, yes, you must have an EIN. You must, must, must have an EIN. Now, what if you're a sole proprietorship, a gig worker, somebody who's driving for uh, Uber, right? Because they're gig workers. They work for themselves. Real estate agent, uh, somebody making jewelry on Etsy, somebody making t-shirts and selling them online. Are these people required for, to have an EIN? No. Sole proprietors are not. Freelance workers are not. All of these people are not. But all of us should do it. All of us should do it. Why, why, do, I, why do I recommend, do you think, that everybody gets an EIN? Every business owner gets an EIN or entrepreneur. Uh, maybe it's a way to protect your assets. So it doesn't give you too much pr uh, uh, protection of assets, um, like uh, as so much as, as other forms of business ownership do, but it does kind of help you in that you're uh, you're not mingling your assets with the business's assets, so it prevents that co-mingling. Hmm. Yeah. So, does that make sense, Philippe? Yes. Mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Good. Good. Thank you. Any other reasons why we might want to have an EIN? <clears throat> you can hire people. That's it. You can hire people. You can't hire people without an EIN. You can't. Um, I mean, you. you you could, but legally you're not able to. Uh, it, it gives you credibility. I mean, you can't open a bank account, a business bank account without an EIN. Uh, it helps all of these uh, reasons, right? Apply for loans, uh, open the account. It makes you look legitimate too. Uh, you don't want to, to go into your first uh, business arrangement and, and not have an EIN and not have a, a, a business account. Um, all right. <clears throat> so, Everyone is able to uh, file for this. It's um, it's it is something that will enable you to pay your taxes, to earn your living, uh, to start your business. But um, you, so I should say, you're able to as an immigrant, regardless of your status, do these things. The one thing that you're not required to do, or a couple of things that you're not required to do, you, you don't have to do an I nine form, and you don't have to, um, you're not, they're not, people aren't allowed to ask you about your immigrant status. They're not allowed to um, ask you uh, about uh, whether or not you have documentation. Now, does everybody know what an I-9 form is? <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> I-9 form? Have you, anybody heard of that term, I-9 form? Yes. Okay. Oh, I heard somebody say yes. Who said that? Is it Jessica? No, I did. Oh, oh, great. So um, do you want to tell people what the I-9 form, roughly what it does, if you know? Uh, it basically um, ensures that you're, you're verifying the employee is a U.S. citizen. Perfect. Yep. Uh, so so uh, all of you have probably seen it before, if you've ever had a job and you are, well, those of you who are, are U.S. citizens, 
have have filled it out before probably it's that document that says please provide us with a couple of forms of id that shows that you're a u.s citizen or legally able to work in this country like your driver's license or your passport etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, and or, or you either do one or the two so if you don't have that that's okay you don't need that there's uh there are uh, there are ways for you to work without an I-9 form, and that's with an EIN, right? As, a, as an independent contractor, gig worker, freelancer, um, basically as um, through this, through this uh, status, this ITN status. So if you're the independent contractor, if you're uh, choosing that route, you will be uh, classified actually as a sole proprietor. You have to then pay self-employment tax. You have to pay income tax and uh, you you have uh, as an independent contractor you have uh, no legal protection through the through the business ownership form so you're going to have to protect your assets another way so let's say you own a house uh, and uh, you are also you also started a business and, and at, well, let's say your business is i don't know ah selling uh, selling salsa at the farmer's market okay so you're selling salsa at the farmer's market and somebody eats the salsa and they have an allergic reaction to it and they have they end up with several hundred thousand dollars worth of medical bills and they come and sue you if you are a sole proprietor they can come after all of your assets every single thing that you own so uh to in order to ensure that that doesn't happen you're going to want to choose a different form of business ownership move my head here heads i wanted to uh we're on slide 25 i just wanted to again show you these forms of business ownership at the beginning here so forms of business ownership that are not protect that don't protect you are over here on the left that's where you you are intrinsically linked to the business forms that do protect your assets are on the right corporations llc's nonprofits, um and uh, co-ops co which are very similar almost to, to nonprofits. Uh, so yeah, and but you don't have to necessarily choose one of these in order to be protected. Can anybody tell me uh, any other ways that you could potentially protect yourself as a, um, as a sole proprietor? How could you protect yourself if you didn't have uh, an LLC or didn't, didn't file for incorporation? I'm assuming there would be some sort of insurance that you could have. That was it. That was it. Nail on the head. You can get insurance. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, all right. So um, we have information here. Uh, I'm not going to get too deep into it, but I do want to talk about uh, some other ways that we can uh, work here as an immigrant in the United States. There are, there are a lot of things to know. Like I said, a lot to cover. And I have all of this information in, uh, in the PowerPoint and the PowerPoint slides, you can access them even afterwards. But um, I'm not going to go through each of these individually but, or, or in depth, but I am going to touch on it. So one of the first steps is getting your green card, uh, depending on which which route you um, you take. And uh, to do this, uh, I, I have instructions here on how to uh, get that green card. Now, once you have that green card, you have residency status, um, you know, the next step is going to be uh, finding or, or choosing a, a, a legal uh, form of business ownership if you have a lot of assets. I don't, it's not necessarily critical that you get, uh, like that you form um, an LLC right away or, or incorporate right away. You can always change later. And especially when you don't have a lot of assets. And, um, but, it, but, you know, even though I say you want to think about that right away, especially when you have the assets. It's not the very first thing to do. You do need to go through and and actually evaluate the idea that you have and uh, and and get help from people who know what they're doing. Get help from people who know what they're doing. Um, that usually takes the form of taking entrepreneurship classes, reaching out to um, to mentors, to advisors. Uh, we have our, our business incubator at, at, at Miramar College. Um, take advantage of, of us, right? Talk to me. Talk to some of the other um, people who are starting businesses here in the United States as, as immigrant entrepreneurs. And <clears throat> you can also reach out to other uh, 
mentor and professional organizations. All of the uh, all of these organizations, when you when you go through this PowerPoint, I have links to all of these in the PowerPoint description. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> and then you'll want to also know how you're going to pay your taxes as either an independent contractor or a um, a, a gig worker or, or freelance worker. And and by the way, does everybody know when we're using the terms independent contractor and freelance worker? Um, you know what we mean by, by that, or or do you know the difference between an independent contractor and a freelance worker? You've heard those terms. Have you guys heard? You've heard those terms before, right? Before this day. So you're working for yourself, right? As uh, through through either one of these, uh, independent contractor. We usually use that term when you are doing uh, maybe like a, a one job for a, a person or an entity, when you're doing a lot of different, uh, you know, you have a lot of different clients, then uh, we usually call that person a freelancer, but they're pretty much the same thing. Uh, and if you are that kind of a freelancer, independent contractor, you do have to file a 1099 for your, uh, to pay your taxes. And you provide the 1099 to the client and then the client at the end of the year provides it back to you, uh, showing how much they um, how much they paid you, uh, so that you could pay taxes on that amount. So uh, I don't want to get too much into it. I want to save time for questions and 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 for the people who um, who've gone through this process um, to share. But um, maybe uh, maybe we'll. I'll, I'll start right here. Anybody have any questions about the difference between? Um, W-2s, W-9s, 1099s, um, any tax questions? I have one question. Definitely. Go, go, yeah. Yeah, so because recently I I needed to, to file my federal tax return. Uh-huh. And uh, I got help from uh, an agent here. And uh, besides that, I got also my California tax return. So. Uh -huh. That means that besides also filing the federal tax return, you also need to file the state tax return every year. Is that right? Oh, yes. Unfortunately, yes. Federal and state. And state of California, they are, they're brutal. They come after you if you don't file your taxes. <laughs> so as soon as the second that you file your federal taxes, they'll start coming after you to get your state taxes. And um, yeah, you have to file both of them. Um, the cool thing is, though, as as um, an entrepreneur, you can write off a ton of expenses, a ton of expenses, and you can avoid paying taxes. And you should, you should, you should avoid paying taxes. There's a difference between tax evasion and tax avoidance. Tax avoidance. I encourage wholeheartedly. I think every single person should own a business, regardless of your status, regardless of your education. Uh, you you should own a business so that you can write off all expenses that are uh, that are joint sort of personal and business expenses. You know, all legitimate expenses, and then you save a ton of money. You don't have to give as much money to the government, basically, right? Uh, and I encourage that tax avoidance as much as you possibly can. I never encourage tax evasion. <laughs> so tax evasion is just not paying taxes uh, or avoiding to the point where it, it's illegal, not reporting income, not uh, claiming personal or business, I'm sorry, personal expenses as business expenses, et cetera. So other questions about taxes or um, how, to, how to take advantage of, of our <laughs> loopholes in our law? I just wanted to make a comment, uh, not really a question, but uh, it's important to know the, the tax code. And even if you have to, you know, spend some money to, to hire someone uh, that can uh, tell you more about that, because the tax code is designed for you to use it, right? Like, so if you're an entrepreneur, you should be writing off anything related to, to yes. your job. You know, you should, you should be an entrepreneur. You should be. So you can, right? Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah, so but I, but I, the one thing I will say though is I, I wouldn't hire. I mean, you can hire somebody right away, but for most of us who are bootstrapping and kind of poor at the beginning, you can. There are so many free resources out there that you don't have to pay. You know, the rec we, we can help. I can put you in, in contact with people. There are um, 
you know, through the school even, we have, uh, if you're SDSU or Miramar, we have people who will do your taxes for you or with you at the end of the year. And um, yeah, use those free resources first and then if, if not pay, but yeah. Other uh, comments from any questions? I had a question. It yeah. went to um, writing things off. Does it matter what type of business you decide to start? Yes, it, it matters in that um, in that you're going to be able to write off maybe more with different types of businesses, but the structure doesn't matter. Anything, you know, any business expense is a write off, right? It's a write off, so it comes off the top of of what you um, earn, and so you don't pay taxes on it. So yeah, I mean, I don't know if that answers your question without getting specific. I, Yes. Yeah. And there is a couple of a, a comment and a question in the chat. There's Thank a, you. I'm so bad at watching the chat while I'm doing this. Yeah. Are great. the free tax services open to rec entrepreneurs? Yes. Yes. There are, uh, we have free, uh, we do at the rec have free tax uh, services that I can put you in touch with and I'd be happy to do that. And yes. Oh, and by the way, actually, I'm going to share my screen a little bit longer because Denise, I wanted to make sure that uh, everybody you know, I'm not going to go through all the slides, but one slide that I have to go through is one of the resources that's available here at Miramar College, and this is so critically important, and that is our, our Dreamers office. So uh, let's see here. Okay. See, I have lots of information there. Please do you guys go through the slides and, and see if, if they help. It I tell you all about the types of visas. I talk about like the H1... Um, uh, the H1, the B1, the HB, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the grants available to all of you. Actually, I'm going to start right here. Miramar Dreamers. So uh, take advantage of the different uh, programs available. There are resources through Immigrants Rising. Uh, they have uh, excellent uh, courses, uh, online education. They have a couple of grants I'll show you here in a minute available to you as entrepreneurs, specifically if you are an immigrant entrepreneur, and even more so if you are here without documentation, we have grants that, that you can apply for. And they're, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty, I, I think they're pretty easy to get if you can uh, meet the criteria uh, for them. So also, Get in touch with the Miramar Dreamers office. We have amazing resources here at Miramar. There's one-on-one -on -one counseling, uh, support services. There's a free legal here. Uh, if you uh, if you qualify for Dream Act, they'll help you with the application. They'll help you with DACA. They'll help you um, fill out whatever you, you need to fill out. And they'll also take new applications. Uh, the contact information is listed here of, of the primary um, people that you can reach out with. I see Denise is, is obviously here with us today too, and I'm sure she could answer questions uh, if, you if you have them. Uh, also, like I said, there's that Immigrants Rising Fund. This is amazing grant. There's amazing fund. You should take advantage of this. I've had students who've, who've now applied for this and they got the uh, Kickstarter grants that you get $2,000 for these little short uh, there, it's a grant, so you don't ever pay it back, right? And um, this is particularly for for undocumented um, undocumented immigrants. Uh, there's also also resources. Opala, sorry, Opala. Uh, also resources available um, available through some of the other organizations that I've linked here. Um, <coughs> Uh, this is a uh, follow this link here if you are interested in learning more about grants that are available to all immigrants. There are so many grants and loans out there for you. The SBA will help you as an immigrant to uh, apply for those uh, those loans. The Micro Enterprise Development Program. This is a service by the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, micro loans for up to fifteen thousand. The Wilson Fish Program is for refugees and. Um, this will again this is grant money this is many that you don't have to pay back all right so all of this is here for you this is my contact information and and us here at the rec um i have also here with us today enzo who he is our sort of resident expert on all things uh, immigrant entrepreneur as an in immigrant entrepreneur himself and we have several Im immigrant entrepreneurs at the rec going through our program and uh, so he can also answer questions uh, for you 
if, if you have them. And he's again here with us today. So with that, I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience. Anybody have questions for any of us? Denise, Enzo, me, Angela, or comments? Yes, I do have one question. So in regards to registering the um, companies, right? With companies that, um, excuse me, that essentially will get um, investment flow into them in the future, most of them will want to register um, a C-Corp in Delaware. Delaware. So um, would they be able to benefit from California programs as well? Yes. So uh, yeah, even though you are a Delaware corporation, uh, you can still file for uh, some of these uh, California programs like the, um, are you, are you mean like the immigrants rising and things like this? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. They're still available to you, even though you are incorporated in Delaware. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's a good question. Good question. <laughs> and, and what she's talking about is if you, if you are going to receive venture capital funds or um, outside investments, you'll want to do a, almost all of those people do file for a Delaware incorporation, right? Yeah. Uh, so that we don't have to pay California state income taxes. So, yeah. And, and that's another thing too, like make sure that you are, are, are choosing the right form of ownership for what you're planning to do. And I, I can help with that. We have lawyers here who can help too. So yeah. Other questions, comments, concerns? There was also a really great question in the chat. Uh -huh. um, it says, does it cost anything to apply for an EIN? No, free, totally free, takes five minutes. Totally free, takes five minutes. Mm -hmm. Do it online. Yeah. And then once you get the EIN, you can go down to the bank and say, hey, I want to open a bank account, interest bearing bank account, even. Um, and it's, it's a business account. And then uh, there are several banks who will say, yep, we can do it with uh, almost, there's a few now that have it with uh, no monthly minimums or anything. And you just get your, um, Get your account. So, yeah, don't get bogged down in the in the, um, you know, don't get bogged down in the details when starting a business. I mean, we want you to 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 do things right, but there's a saying in entrepreneurship that I use all the time, and that's, um, you know, uh, perfection is the enemy of progress. Be careful about being a perfectionist. Sometimes it's it's more important to to do and you know. But at the same time, you don't want to make huge mistakes when it comes to taxes or anything. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any other uh, questions, comments, concerns? Um, is there any type of filing system you recommend of like tracking all of the write-offs that you have throughout the entire year or quarter or whatever? Yes, there are several different ways you can do it. it depends on how big the business is and and uh, you know how many expenses you have. If you're small yourself. Uh, you know, for, I always just kept, uh, you know, a list of everything and um, you don't even have to keep the receipts because you may have to show the receipts later, but then uh, they'll let you know and what kinds, but um, yeah, you don't even have to keep them. Um, there are apps though that now um, are, are better than the systems. I think that, that I would uh, that I've used in the past as a small uh, business owner or as a new um, startup. Um, I'm trying to think of any good apps that I've, I've done. Now, obviously QuickBooks, right? So QuickBooks is something that almost every uh, business owner uses, uh, Quick in QuickBooks. I don't know, Angela, can you think of any other? I saw Dawn here early too. Any other things we can use to- I mean, worst case. Sorry. Go ahead, Angela, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, I couldn't hear you there. Sorry. Yeah, you have bad bad connection on the sound there, Angela. Uh, Tanya, I, I, that's Don. I'm I am here. Yeah, I would. I think a lot of people start with QuickBooks, which is a great um, resource. So you can also use Excel. You know, if you. Yeah, that's what I always use before. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. Sorry about the audio problem. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. A lot of us just do use Excel, but QuickBooks is is, is better. Does it, is there a cheaper or free version for students, Don? Do you know? You know, well, if, if Miramar had an EDU account, um, yes, because they do have education. There's an education department within Intuit. So as an instructor, I'm able to get, um, I'm able to get the software. So, yeah. So, so just so, so everybody knows what she's talking about with an EDU account, you can get it. Uh, or I mean with an edu uh, email, email address but i've i've applied for e an edu uh, email through the rec and it looks like we're uh, we hopefully I, sh I shouldn't say but uh, we're on track to get approved for that so if you are part of the rec you'll be able to get an edu and then get um, free 
Yeah. So gosh, hopefully, you know, that's been in the pipeline for, for several months, probably close to a year now, but we're getting very close to having that there. So, well, yeah, I, I would say, I don't know. I can't say for sure, just because I didn't, I didn't do that scenario, but I did, you have to email. Um, I would, I would advise going to Intuit education, just do a Google for Intuit education provider and, okay. and then explain your scenario. And I don't know if they are going to be giving it to all students, but, um, but if you take the QuickBooks class, you do get a free trial access. Um, I know that much. Nice. Um, Dawn teaches that, uh, uh, teaches, well, she's the, she's the director of, of, uh, the, uh, accounting program at Miramar and actually the, the chair of the department, but do you teach the QuickBooks class too, or? I have not taught it in years. Um, Susan Noble and Rachel Ferris teach it, uh, but at the time, you know, everyone that, when I did, I taught it maybe three or four years ago. Everyone got access to the software. Yeah, yeah. So in QuickBooks Online, I've been hearing a lot of entrepreneurs and business people are really enjoying QuickBooks Online. I'm a trained CPA, so I, I like the desktop version better, but I've been hearing from business owners that are new to accounting that they like uh, QuickBooks Online. Yeah, that's what I've been using right right now is QuickBooks Online. And uh, I like it because then, you know, you can use your phone and you don't have to you know, you don't have to, um, I don't know, it's just easy for, for me. It's easy. Yeah. Anybody else have any other feedback or thoughts on that or? Tanya, for, um, you know, say I'm, I'm ready to start a business. I think I am, but the word entrepreneurship just so big and scary, right? So what would be the first three things you would say, you know, start with doing these things. So um, you, you should, Take a class it would be the easiest thing. Take an entrepreneurship class, uh, Google, <laughs> Google entrepreneurship. And if you if you are an immigrant entrepreneur, reach out to the uh, to to the Dreamers office and and um, you know get 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 the support. Just use the resources that are here for you. We are here to help you. Basically, don't do it alone. You don't have to be scared. You don't have to feel like you're in in a, on it or in on your own in this, you know, there are people yeah. to help you. Oh, and by the way, if you want to join the rec too, uh, now in order to join the rec, so we're that bus a business incubator, you had to have had at least one entrepreneurship class before uh, so that you know the basics of entrepreneurship. But once you've had that class, you can, you can bring your idea and we'll help you develop that into a business. And um, I was going to say on April 22nd, we have an information session at the rec. It's an open info session. I think it's at seven o'clock. Everybody's welcome to come to that. Um, I'll share you the, uh, well, we're almost we're out of time here, but I will share the link to the uh, event, right? Maybe Angela or uh, Angela can grab that for us. And um, yeah, and we just have two more minutes. Is anybody else? Have any other yes, I have a question. So when you said the entrepreneurship class, is it the one at Miramar or can it be any entrepreneurship class in San Diego? It can be even out of San Diego. I just want to make sure that you have that foundation. SBDC. Mm -hmm. what no, the no, no, no. SBDC. Yeah, so that would be that was, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So I, I'm not, I'm not picky about about where you get the education. I just want to make sure that you, you know, you know the terms you've developed. Uh, like, you've gone through and know like what's a business model canvas, and you understand uh, what we mean when we say what's a business model, for example, right? Uh, things like that. <laughs> Yeah, but well, it's, I'm not you. Uh, one specific class or anything like this. Yeah, of course, of course, Rula. Uh, Ricky, did you have a question or does somebody else have a, have a question? Oh, here? yes, I actually have a question. Yeah, yeah. Hi, I just got out of, out of work and uh, I was screen recording the, the Zoom, so mm -hmm. I'll see what I can get out of it. But um, so I have a question for like uh, undocumented um, mm -hmm. immigrants and and if I want to start uh, like a, a restaurant, uh -huh. um, can, I, can I get grants? Yes, yes. Okay, and, and like, uh, what are, uh, what do I need, like, uh, to to so, receive those grants? So, um, I would say the PowerPoint slides uh, are in the chat here, and uh, so grab the those there and and uh, go through those slides. Now, for the video recording, we actually have a video recording of this lecture here. Uh, go to our YouTube channel as of tomorrow; you'll be able to access it, and that'll help because there's just so many things. So, I'll watch that video, and that'll help a lot. It'll help a lot. And yeah, there's lots available for you. Oh, okay. All right. Well, Thank oh, you. yes, of course, Ricky. Yeah, and and then specific questions. Once you get there, just ask me, and I'm happy to help. I'm going to actually stop the recording now because we're out of time, and say goodbye to those of you who. I got appreciate you. Thank you. you. No, but I'll, and I'll stick around if you if you do have any extra questions for me. But yeah, thanks everybody. Bye. Uh, take care. Thanks for coming.